and uh, thanks everyone for uh, coming um, this morning or afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, yeah, we've got an interesting topic today. Um, and uh, again, you're in listen only mode, um, so you won't be able to ask questions directly, but um, feel free to type questions into the question pane as we go. Um, this is gonna be a, I, I would, I guess, a somewhat informal uh, webcast with uh, just, I thought it would be an interesting topic to discuss, you know, some of the weird things that, um, that Vault does that I've seen over the years, that our customers have seen over the years, um, and that get really confusing and maybe frustrating at times. Um, but I also wanted to present them in the context of behavior that people may not be familiar with all of the details about with Vault. So um, what I've got up here on the screen now is our agenda for the topics that I know for sure that I wanna cover. Um, I wanna do a, a fairly in-depth review of Vault file revision behavior um, because there's some intricacies there that I think a lot of people don't quite understand and it can lead to really confusing behavior. Um, I also wanna talk about um, the impact of migrating Inventor and Vault, um, like mostly the impact of on Inventor or what happens with Inventor when you migrate Vault, um, because that can also lead to a lot of confusion. Um, we're gonna talk about the job server and the job processor. Um, that can cause confusion a lot of times. Um, the get command we'll talk about because it seems pretty simple, but there's some interesting things you can do. And if you're not paying attention, you can maybe get things you didn't expect. Um, and then finally, we'll wrap up with um, some less obvious or obscure configuration settings, especially on the Vault server side. Um, most people don't touch their Vault server very often. Um, and there are some things that you can only change there that impact you know, the user experience. And, you know, you may have always wondered why does this work that way? Well, it's something maybe you can change on the server side. Um, and then of course, again, if you've got questions as we're going through, if there are things that um, you wanna know why Vault does what it does, um, please feel free to type those into the question pane. I'll do my best to address them. I can't guarantee that I can answer them, um, but I'll, I'll certainly try. <clears throat> So let's start by talking about fault file revision behavior. Um, I want to start with some uh, vocabulary uh, to make sure we're all on the same page with the terms that I'm using. Um, one of the key aspects or kind of the driving sort of top level object in Vault that drives file revision behavior is what's called a lifecycle definition. Um, that is a collection of states and transitions. States are stopping points in the workflow. It conveys status of a document. So something like work in progress, review, released, that's a state. Um, the state can control access. Um, so for example, can someone um, see the file? Can they modify it? Can they delete it? Delete it? Um, as of the latest releases of Vault, can they download it? Um, it controls purge settings. So should this specific version of this file be kept when we do a purge? Um, it also controls the, the flag on that status of, um, is this a released version or is it an obsolete version? So a state is the stopping point in a lifecycle definition. Um, a transition is how the file will move from one state to another. Um, and there are lots of settings on a transition. Um, criteria, so for example, um, properties compliance must be compliant, which is a confusing thing we, we'll get to in a minute. Um, maybe certain properties have to be filled out or certain properties have to be empty, right? There are actions and there are a whole lot of actions depending on the life cycle and the object it's working against. So for example, you could say, um, check that dependent child files are released. So you can't release an assembly without all of its children being released. That flag is very important, um, but it also can cause confusion 
um, which we'll see here in a little bit. Um, it lets you specify custom job types. So if you have written your own custom job processor jobs, or if you're using software like Cool Orange Power Jobs, that's how you would tell the transition to queue a job with a certain custom name so that your custom job processor plugin can execute that job. Um, and then of course there are security settings, who's allowed to make the transition. Um, and that's pretty much a simple toggle, either who can make it or not. And if you can't make their transition, you can't see it. You don't even know that that transition exists. Um, and then I do wanna draw a distinction between version and revision, um, because that does confuse uh, people sometimes. And I've got uh, an illustration of that coming in just a second. Um, a revision is essentially a revision level, and that is typically a collection of file versions. Um, a version is something that just happens in Vault. Every time the record changes in some way, even a very small way, um, there's a new version that gets created. A revision is more of an engineering or a business decision. You decide when the revision of the record changes, right? Um, so again, the basic idea of a life cycle or revision behavior is, you know, a file gets created, it's being worked on, you know, work in progress is the out of the box, you know, name for a state like that. Um, you do some work on it, eventually the file goes into a review, review step. Not everybody does that, um, but, you know, that's a very common workflow. Um, if review is passed, it becomes released. Then when the file needs to change, it goes back to the work state. So it is a cycle. Um, it may or may not be a new revision. Again, that's a decision that's up to really who was ever editing the document. But then again, the changes get reviewed and then released again, right? So that the idea of the life cycle. Um, now, where things become complicated, because that sounds pretty simple, right? But when things get complicated are, um, is like, is it an inventor assembly? Does it have child parts? Are those ch child parts released? Typically, an assembly is really just a recipe. An inventor assembly is just a recipe. Um, it depends on the parts that make it up. And you generally aren't gonna wanna release an assembly before all of the children are done because now this assembly is released and maybe locked for edit and the referenced parts are changing and now the assembly document itself is not gonna be up to date. Um, this change I'm making, is it significant enough to require a revision increment? Again, that's really a business or an engineering decision and that's something you can toggle or specify in the vault. Um, you make that decision either by configuring the lifecycle or by explicitly changing a revision. Um, and then uh, a really vexing question. Um, if a child part or component is revised, does the parent need to be revised as well? So I have an assembly, assembly one, and it references part one. They're both rev A. Well, we make a revision to part one that becomes rev B. Do we need to rev assembly one? Some people would say yes, every time you rev a part, you rev the assembly. But what if part one is used across a hundred different assemblies? Um, are you gonna go and revise a hundred different assemblies every time that part changes? Um, typically in my experience, a revision means that the file is not, the part should say, is not changing in a way that impacts form, fit, or function. So that should be interchangeable with prior revisions of that part. Meaning if I don't explicitly go to an assembly and update that assembly with the specific new revision and verify that it still functions, if I don't do that myself, I should still be confident that at least it will still function. Um, you know, if an old rev gets associated with an assembly, it may not have the, the latest improvements, but at least it'll function, right? Now, if it's a, something you're changing for like safety purposes or something, maybe that would drive, um, you know, we do need to go to every assembly and make sure that, you know, explicitly in our systems, be it Vault or ERP or whatever, that every assembly is using the latest revision. Um, but depending on the system you're using, Vault included, 
you can have the system always give you the latest revision of something, regardless of what was specifically used um, at a specific prior revision. But because you can do that, that can lead to some confusing behavior sometimes, especially if you're not really familiar with the interface and, and what you're seeing. So I'm gonna show you some of the intricacies of that in just a second. Um, but again, just to highlight the difference between version and revision, because this does become important, um, let's take a look at, say, the, the flow of a document that gets created and then revised. So over here on the left, we've got, you know, the file gets created, um, checked into Vault, becomes version one, Rev A, right? Maybe our rules are set up to make that happen automatically. Um, and then we put it into a review state. Maybe that becomes version two. We're still Rev A. Um, and then the file gets released. That's version three, still Rev A, right? So now we have released Rev A. And then we do, we make a revision. The file goes back into a work in progress. Well, especially out of the box, and most in most of the cases where I've worked with customers to implement Vault, when you put the file back into a work state from released, the revision level increments automatically. So now we have revision B, that's version four, and then five, six, all the way through the process. Eventually we have revision B, which happens to be released, which happens to be version eight. So the version is always counting up. The rev change happens when we say, right? All of these versions are really considered revision A, and all of these versions are considered revision B. Um, and you absolutely can have multiple released versions within a given revision, um, be it because you did a quick change or because you have some custom job that updates some properties, for example, that creates a new released version. But Vault is smart enough to understand that there may be multiple released versions within a revision. And anytime someone says, give me the released version for Rev B, I should, Vault gives you the latest released version. Okay. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the get command and then I'm gonna show you a little bit of software and some things that, that can happen to you. Um, let's talk about the get command, right? Because getting files should be pretty easy, right? I see a file, I wanna get it, give it to me. Um, if we're talking about Windows Explorer, yeah, the file's just there in a folder. I can open it, I can copy it, whatever. <clears throat> in Vault, it's not quite that simple though because we have history of these files in the system and these files have relationships. So if we're looking at an assembly here, we see I'm looking right now at the latest information for this assembly. It's currently in a, a state called for review. And we can see the version and revision of all of the components that it references. So if I get this set of files right now, here's what I'm gonna get. I'm gonna get the latest, in this case, the absolute latest of everything, even if that information is not released. Right, so here's a part, for example, that's a work in progress. Um, I'm gonna get the absolute latest. So this is typically what I'm gonna do if I'm an engineer, if I'm using CAD, if I'm working on this assembly, I wanna see the latest of everything because if I'm working on something in this assembly, if someone else is working on another component, I'm not familiar with the changes they've made, I wanna make sure that what they did isn't impacting negatively what I'm about to do. Now, if instead my goal is to see, okay, I wanna get this file, but show me what has been released for all of the related files. There's a little checkbox right here called use released for related files. And if we check that, notice suddenly all of these files that were maybe for review or work in progress and different revisions and different versions, now I'm getting the, re the latest version of the latest the latest released version of the latest revision of all of these things, right? Now, I could instead say, I don't want the latest of this assembly itself. I want some prior revision of this. So that's where I could change what I'm after and say, give me Rev D for review. And with this box checked, I'm still getting 
released information, but notice it's not exactly the same released information. So the latest says this is rev B for blade one right here. But if I say give me specifically rev D for review, basically that specific version, notice there are actually some files in here that are completely different. This file is in the latest version of the model, but it's not what was specifically checked in with that version, right? So depending on exactly how I manipulate this dialogue, and if I, you know, I'm gonna get different results. And so it does really pay to pay attention to the version and revision that you're getting of these files. If you're, especially if you're intending to work on anything historical, or if you need to see what happened at a specific prior version or revision. Um, if you're always just give me the latest because I'm working on something and I always want the latest data at my disposal, this is the default that you see right there. That's what you're gonna get, right? Um, so, Pay close attention to the get command because it can lead to a lot of confusion in the inventor browser, especially when you start working. And then of course, you've got the complexity of where do these files go? Um, into the working folders by default, um, into a folder that you say otherwise, um, you could say, no, don't give me <laughs> this, which seems kind of weird, but you know, this is a way you could check those files out without getting a copy, like if you wanted to lock them, for example. Um, and then of course, force overwrite. You can say, I had some changes in my local workspace. I don't intend to keep them. Give me what this is, no matter what's in my local workspace, right? So with all of that explanation, I wanted to lay the groundwork to help you understand the answers to some of these questions. Um, some of these are very simple. You may already know the answers to them. You may know exactly what's happening, um, but we get these questions a lot. I get these questions a lot. So this is you know, what we're gonna discuss here. So first of all, what's the state historical property? Um, so let's take a look at Vault here. Uh, let's see, there we go. So we should be able to see this now. Um, so this is Vault, right? Um, Vault Professional we're looking at specifically. Um, and if I look at a file in Vault and look at its history tab, um, you'll notice this state historical. So we have state and we have state historical. Um, so this, these two are different, of course. You can see right now, this is like a single property, but if I include the state property down at the bottom as well, You notice these guys don't have a state property at all, right? There's no state here other than the last version. So state is the current state of the latest version of the file, right? So the latest version of the file has a property called state and it is populated. All prior versions of that file do not have a state property. Um, their state historical property captures the state of the file when that version was the latest, right? And so that's important so that you can look back in time and see, okay, this thing, you know, was released and then it got revised, it was a work in progress, and then there were there was another version that got created at work in progress, so somebody must have checked in some changes and then, you know, checked in some more changes, for example. So that's the difference, state versus state historical. Um, you might also see file name, right? There's also a, a name historical property so that you can actually see what the previous name of a file was if it was ever renamed, which can be useful, right? Um, and the second question here is, um, is very common, um, especially if you've moved from Vault Basic to say Vault Workgroup or Vault Professional and you start using the lifecycle behavior. Why can't I release my assembly? Because all of the children are released, but then every time I try to release the assembly, it says I can't do that, right? Um, 
The problem is the assembly references a prior revision of a child and that revision never had a released version, right? So here's an example. So I have an assembly here. It's currently revision A, work in progress. And it uses three different parts, right? Well, this is the latest data. So if you look at this on the users tab, this is similar to the get dialog. This is the latest version. If I look specifically at Rev A, work in progress, so this is specifically Rev A. This is what was checked in, Rev A, work in progress, the last version. And you can see that version of the assembly doesn't reference revision A of this part. Because this part here, even though it is currently released, when it was first checked in, it had no behavior. It was in the base category and it had no revision. But it actually did have a revision. When we're talking about Vault Workgroup and Vault Professional, every file does have a revision level. It just might be what's called the null revision, meaning there's no revision level assigned to it. So there was a revision of this file. And as we can see, what we did to this file is we changed its category to engineering, and that assigned it a revision level, and it assigned it a state at that point, but it left the null revision without any sort of released version. Okay, so we have a file in here where one of its prior revisions never got released. Coincidentally, this assembly references that null revision. And how that happened was I checked everything into Vault. I changed the category of this part after everything was checked in, thereby changing its revision level. The assembly still references the null revision. This is a very important thing to understand. By default, an inventor assembly is going to reference the revision of the file that it was last checked in with. And it does not automatically update to use the latest revision of all children. Vault does not do that update for you automatically. And I believe that's on purpose because there may be situations where you don't want an assembly to be pointing to the latest revision of a file. You may want to go at some point and do that yourself when you go and vet that that didn't cause any problems. So Vault does not make the assumption that when you change the revision of a part, an assembly should automatically use that latest revision. You have to open that assembly up in Inventor Make sure when you save that assembly in Inventor, meaning check it out, save it, it is pointing to the revision you want, and then check that back into Vault. So because of that behavior, you get this situation, right? So this file is released, this file is released, this file's latest revision is released. So when you look at this, the latest, you can say, okay, all the children are released. I should have no problem coming in here and releasing this assembly, but no. And if you look at the information, it says revision something of why problem part is not released. And this is, gets really confusing. It's like, well, but I see right here, it's released. It says right here, but there's an extra little space in there. <laughs> and again, this is the null revision which is not released because this assembly uses the null revision. So to fix that, you need to open the assembly in Inventor, 
I'm pretty sure I picked open. Let me get logged into Vault here. I'll just open it this way. Um, you need to open that in Inventor um, with the correct revision in your workspace, Rev A, um, and then update it. Right, so if we come in here and open that guy up, here's my assembly. Get Make sure down here when you're opening from Inventor, you can also pick specifically. This can get confusing as well because this works the same way as the get command would. So in this case, I wanna make sure I get the latest of everything, right? And you know the, the non-released versus released bias is available here too. So you have that same control in Inventor um, as the get command. Right, so now if we come down here, we can see this is pointing to Rev A, Rev A, Rev A now. Notice this little thing in here too, not the expected revision. You see that little tooltip, not the expected revision because the last time this guy was checked in, it was using the null rev. So this is just a little warning that says, by the way, this is changing revision if you save this. So I can save this now and check it in and notice that not the expected revision tag went away, right? Now I check this in. And now that we're using the latest revision, oh, I have an off screen window. That's what's going on here. Oh, it was my uh, question pane for GoToMeetings on the top and it was hiding that dialogue for me. Um, this okay got it checked out all right so let's come back here refresh so now i should be able to release this because even rev a work in progress now uses all released children and now it releases with no problem right so that's pretty complicated right but it's important a behavior to understand because it can cause a lot of confusion. Um, and this could happen in various ways. Um, I've had trouble making it happen once I get out of the null revision. So it may be the biggest issue when you transition from something like Vault Basic to Workgroup or Pro, or if you were not using any sort of behaviors in Workgroup or Pro and decide to start using the lifecycle behavior, just know that you're gonna have to pay close attention to your referencing documents and what revisions that they use. Okay. So why doesn't assembly revision A reference my part revision B? Again, that's what we just talked about. The fact that Vault does not automatically make your assembly reference the latest revision of everything. It's a little confusing because depending on, again, how you use say the get command, it can look like it does. Because again, if I say latest, use released bias, you know, this is using the latest, the certain revisions. Or if I say just the latest, it looks like it is referencing everything. But again, remember from a historical perspective, each of these past versions specifically references its children. So I can actually use the get command down here. If I go and pick get on version eight, when I do that, notice I cannot make any changes to how I'm looking at this screen. And I can't say use released for related files. This is gonna give me specifically what versions were referenced by this prior version. So there's always a way you can see in Vault what versions were associated with a specific parent. You just got to know how to do it. So the history tab in my experience is the best way to do that because you can always go to a specific prior version. No, you cannot do that with the get command. All you can really do is go back to essentially the latest released versions of these old revs or the latest version itself. 
um, or the null rev you see right there. Um, but if you want to get a specific version's relationship information, in my experience, the best way to do that is come down here, get, and this list will show you those specific versions. And in parentheses here, it has the specific version there. Okay, so um, let's move on to a, a few other things um, that are sort of related. Some of these questions, I tried to put everything into buckets and the buckets weren't exactly perfect. This one kind of goes along with life cycle. Um, it inherently is its own thing, but it has life cycle implications. And that the, that's the idea of properties compliance, right? Um, so if we, we look here, um, we can see this little column right here for compliance. And we can see some of these files are compliant and some of these files are non-compliant. So this is a system property of documents and it's a, just a simple true false. Is it compliant or not? Well, actually, no, it's not a simple true false because you have non-compliant and you have non-compliant equivalents. So there are actually three options there. It's either compliant or it's non-compliant or you have non-compliant equivalents, right? So compliant is pretty clear. It complies with property restrictions, meaning all of its properties, be they system or user defined, they all meet all of the rules for these properties. When I say rules, it could be things like a minimum length for a property, the property must have a value, um, things like that, right? So that so again, we have certain criteria we can put on properties. If you've ever configured a vault property, you're probably familiar with this, but the idea we could say, um, we can have a list of values and we can enforce that list of values. So one way a, a file could be out of compliance could be there's a value, but it's not on the list of values that are allowed. Another way is that it could be violating um, whether like the requires value criteria or a minimum or maximum length, right? So we have these criteria. Um, and by the way, it is possible to override these criteria per category, right? So if you've got different categories in your vault and certain categories need to have values, for example, while other categories don't, this is a way you can have one property but have different restrictions based on the category the document is in. Now the other type, which is all of the files I see here, is non-compliant equivalence. Now that sounds a bit odd, it may be confusing about what it actually is, but um, what that means is there are property mappings between the property definition in Vault and the document type, and the Vault value of the property does not match the document property. And this happens a lot, and you'll see this a lot when you first take a file and move it from released to work in progress. Notice this was compliant, and as soon as I do that, it's immediately non-compliant. What happened was the vault revision bumped to Rev B, but I never opened the document so that the document could be updated with the correct property value of Rev B. So if I scroll down here in the properties panel, I'm eventually gonna see a red exclamation point. This red exclamation point says, here are properties that are experiencing non-compliant equivalence, meaning an equivalence error. And if you put your cursor over it, it'll tell you exactly what's going on. The file is value is A, and it's mapped to revision. So you can see right there, file says A, vault says B, that's where the equivalence problem is. Now with something as simple as that, I can often go to synchronize properties and Vault will update that file property for me, right? Successfully updated from Vault file property revision, right? And now my non-compliant equivalence goes away and I could release the file, right? 
So again, this could stop you from releasing a file um, if you've got that restriction on your life cycle. And that's what that means. And if you need, wanna know how to fix it, especially if synchronized properties doesn't work, which I have seen situations where it doesn't, um, you would need to check that file out and Vault can tell you, it can help you find what needs to be resolved, right? Be it a system property like revision or a user defined property. You know, maybe someone changed a Vault property and they did it on a system that couldn't update the Vault document for whatever reason. Um, you know, that's how you would resolve that is either synchronize properties or check out you know, and maybe even you have to go as far as hitting the update properties button in Inventor. Um, usually when you open a file in Inventor, it'll ask you if you wanna update the properties, you say yes and you're good. I have seen situations where it doesn't ask you, um, in which case you might wanna explicitly hit update properties. Um, the next one is a difficult one to address and resolve. Um, the dreaded unknown status. And I've got an example of that in my vault right here handy, the little yellow circle with an I in it. Um, the basic idea of unknown status is very simple, right? What that means is I have a local copy of this file, but for whatever reason, my vault client cannot determine whether my local copy, how it relates to the vault copy, the latest version. Um, now, the primary way the vault client makes that determination, and if you show hidden files on your Windows Explorer, you probably have seen these folders, this little underscore V folder right here. This underscore V keeps little files. So here's 2021assembly.iam. So here's the, the file right there. If you look inside this file, it's got a little bit of information on it, right? Here's some seemingly random numbers and some dates and times. So the Vault client compares what it knows about the file, what the Vault knows about the file to your local and it stores this information anytime there's a manipulation of, of the file in your workspace. It will update this file to store things like, um, this is essentially a checksum, and this is information about the time the file last changed. So one surefire way to get this, well, I say that, but there are other checks. One very common way to see this little I is if you come and delete this underscore V folder. Now it may not immediately show this in Vault because there are other checks that get done, um, primarily um, changing the, checking the, the date and time for the file's last edit. Um, so just deleting that, that folder here, and we'll just try it, deleting that folder may or may not cause a bunch of eyes. See, I didn't cause any problem. Um, that's because there are some other checks. But if for some reason, the date and time are different between your workspace on the file and what the vault thinks it should be, you'll almost certainly then get a little I. Um, the reason this I is here is because I rolled back a lifecycle state change, right? So I changed the state of a file, say from released to work in progress. So I'm gonna change state. Right. First, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna follow what is generally a best practice and I'm gonna clean out my local workspace. It is a best practice, especially to avoid this little I. It is a best practice to keep your local workspace as clean as possible. If you're not working on something for a while, don't keep a copy of it around. So if I change the state of this to WIP, get a new version, get a copy of it, and then undo my lifecycle state change, immediately I get an I. That's because the version of the file I have in my workspace no longer exists in Vault. So this could also happen with a purge. If you had an old version of a file in your workspace, today you might see the little red refresh symbol. Overnight, your admin does a purge of Vault, that version gets 
nuked, come in tomorrow morning. Now that red refresh symbol is replaced with an I. And now who knows how this file compares. So again, that's another reason why you want to keep um, your local workspace clean. Um, and another one here, well, I get this a lot. When you check a file in to Vault, maybe you're creating a DWF, and then you can preview the file, right? On your preview tab, you can go and see it. And then you change the state to review, and suddenly it's gone, right? Um, that's default behavior, but you can control that. The idea is just by changing the state of that file, it has technically changed. It's no longer a work in progress, it's in review. And let's say, for example, you are mapping your state property to the document so that you can show that state on the drawing. Well, that DWF is now out of date. So ideally, you should update that DWF somehow, maybe through the job processor. So out of the box, um, changing the state of a file breaks the link between the DWF and the file. At least the DWF is still there, but the DWF is no longer representative of the file, and so it no longer shows it in a preview. Um, same thing for renaming a file, I believe, for checking out a file and checking it back in. Um, but you can control those things under these visualization attachment options. Uh, nope, visualization management, sorry. So here are all of the things that will cause the DWF link to break. So if I change the category, if I edit properties, if I synchronize properties, if I change state, if I even move the file, right? So depending on your workflow, it may be possible and realistic for you to create a DWF when you check in from Inventor and have it follow all the way through the rest of the process. So you could uncheck a lot of these boxes, especially the change state box, and your DWF would still be visible. Now, I'm not recommending that you turn these off unless for sure you know that that's safe because you always want that DWF to represent um, the CAD model or the drawing, especially with the new thin client behavior where it will render a DWF in the browser. I think DWF is now a whole lot more important than it used to be. Um, so if you do choose to take any of these things off, make sure you're careful, but you will always see if you don't have your job processor created, or if you don't go and hit the update button here, you will always see that message that it's not a system controlled visualization file, meaning the DWF got created when someone checked it in. And because those settings could be changed, um, the DWF may not be representative of the latest version of the data in Vault. Um, so just something to keep in mind, you can change that behavior. Um, just be careful with it. All right, so um, we have a fair amount to get through. That was the bulk of what I wanted to talk about today, but a few other things to talk about. Um, migration, because this leads to another extremely com common confusing behavior. And when we're talking about migration, we're talking about the entire environment. So if you're using Vault and Inventor, we migrate Vault to the latest version, we migrate Inventor to the latest version. And what happens when you do that, on the Vault side, Vault migration is only migrating the Vault databases and the schema of any Inventor content center libraries. It does not migrate all of the file contents, right? Any files in the file store and any templates in a custom Inventor Content Center library are still in the prior re release of whatever software you were using. Now, combine that with the fact that Inventor files must always be migrated before they can be used in a new release, that can cause some problems. Now, this is largely transparent to most people, the idea that files must be migrated because Inventor, by default, migrates the files in memory the first time you open them in a new release. So if you're not a very you know, savvy Inventor user, if you've not been using it for a while or gone through migrations, 
you may not even realize that that's what happens. But yes, I have an Inventor 2020 file. I open it up in Inventor 2022. During that open, Inventor migrates that file in memory to the latest version, the one that I'm working in. Right? What that means is the file is now different in memory than it was on disk. And that vault status, this vault status here, always compares what you have on disk to what's in the vault. Not what's in memory in Inventor, but what's saved on disk, right? Um, so that leads to a couple questions. The first one I think is the most important. Why does the status of files in Inventor turn green? I never checked them out. I never modified them. I didn't do anything. And now I have all these green circles. Or I have all these files that I have to save, but I didn't touch them, right? Well, that's because we have an old version of the assembly. So this is my 2021 assembly. I'm going to open this up. Right. And now notice the little asterisks here. So these files are locked. They're released in Vault. The asterisk means that it's changed in memory. That's because all these files were saved in 2021 format and I've now upgraded to 2022. So when I go to hit save here, I'm going to get this dialog. And what you can't see, what's going to happen over here, notice it's going to save all three of these files. And if I expand the dialog, you can see here's why it's saving it. It's saving it because of migration. And notice this write enable, not checked out from Vault. So if I hit, hit OK, right, I can't see that now because of the padlock. But what I would see here if these files were not locked is I would see a bunch of green circles now. And now I don't know whether I actually made an edit to the file or whether it was just due to migration now that I've actually saved it and maybe walked away from my computer or didn't expand that dialogue and look. So now it's like, do I really need to check this file in? If it's released, it's not a big deal, right? Because I can't check it in anyway. Um, this is a bigger problem in say Vault Basic where you don't have that concept, um, where everything is always in a state where you could check it out unless someone else has got it checked out. That could lead you to um, be confused about whether you really need to update that file or not. So I had to save those files to check in the new version of the assembly. That's why Inventor releases the read-only lock and saves it for you. Because otherwise, in this case, I would be stuck. I don't have permission to change the state of library files, and admin does that. But it's So I can't check it out, but it's read-only. So I can't save it, meaning I can't check in my assembly. So that's the compromise. Inventor will unlock the local file so that you can save it, so that you can check in a referencing file. That's the compromise, but that does lead to confusion. Green circles or locally modified copies, et cetera. Um, so one way to avoid that is to, every time you upgrade your vault, migrate all your inventor data. No problem, right? <laughs> um, well, if you have a 200 gig or 500 gig or five terabyte file store, that's gonna take a long time. And all of those files are changing, meaning you're gonna get new copies of all of those files in the vault. Never mind the fact that you might have to use the task scheduler and you might have to run it for days depending on the size of your data set. So the official recommendation from Autodesk is don't necessarily migrate all of your vault file, vaulted files every time you upgrade. Um, you need to make a decision about what it is you're going to migrate. So you may want to migrate things because when you open up an assembly or a part in Inventor, migrating in a memory, it does take time. Right? Um, so per, for performance reasons, you might want to migrate. Um, you often will want to migrate library files so that you don't have run into this issue of constantly write enabling files for files people can't check out. So 
Um, there's a pretty good knowledge base article about um, if you should migrate your files and when and what the what the decisions are. I won't go into it here, but just keep in mind that that can cause confusion. You might see some weird behaviors immediately after an upgrade, and then over time the behaviors sort of disappear. And so it may leave you thinking, well, every time we upgrade, we have problems, and then they just go away. Um, there's a good chance that's related to migration. Um, and then the other question here, um, why don't my content centers work after I migrate Vault and Inventor? That's because, again, the Vault only migrates the databases. Um, it doesn't migrate the contents, the actual templates stored inside the content center database. That's a separate step you have to go through in Inventor. You just run the migration tool from your project dialog. Um, unless you've got a gigantic content center library, it usually takes uh, seconds to a couple minutes and you're done. All right. Um, and we are very quickly running out of time. So I'm gonna just quickly go through the job processor. Um, not everybody uses the job processor. If you do use the job processor, you may have seen some weird behaviors. Um, just to quickly explain what the job processor is and does, um, Vault Workgroup and Professional have this concept of a job server or job server, yes. Um, when I change the lifecycle state, when I execute a transition, a job could go on a queue like synchronize properties, update view, meaning create DWF, create a PDF now in the later versions of Vault. And the need to execute those jobs is maintained on the server in a job queue. Now, a Vault client application with a license somewhere in the environment, sometimes on the Vault server, um, sometimes on a separate workstation, will execute those jobs. It will look at the queue, pull a job off of the queue, do that job, meaning, you know, create a DWF and throw it back into the Vault, create a PDF and put it back in the Vault, optionally copy it out to a network, right? Um, so there's a separate computer called the job processor doing that job. But the fact that these things are disconnected, CAD user checks in, job goes on the queue, eventually the job processor gets to it, that can cause some trouble sometimes. Um, the DWF or PDF not having the latest information, these days this, this used to be a real problem. Um, and years ago I, I validated a workflow where I could reliably reproduce a DWF being out of date. Um, I have not been able to do that lately, so I think some things have changed, and I think the DWF job is now much more reliable, especially with Inventor Server, basically as of 2018.2 Vault. Um, I think DWF update is a lot more reliable. So if you stayed away from the job processor and DWF in the past because of some weird things you saw, you should really revisit it because I think it's gotten a lot better. Um, so another question, why does it take so long for the job processor to start? I queued this job up forever ago, um, meaning forever is like four minutes ago, and um, it hasn't started yet. Um, well, there is on the computer running the job processor in the program files folder, um, there'll be a file called jobprocessor.exe.config. Um, and there we go, right there. There's a setting in this file that controls how frequently the job processor looks for new jobs. And I don't remember exactly where it is. Here we go. Period in minutes, value 10. Um, so you can change this down to, and I think you can use a decimal, like you could even go down to like 0.1, for example. So you could make your job processor queue for new jobs almost instantly, right? Just keep in mind, it's gonna be hitting the vault a lot more often and yada, yada, yada. But I have environments where this is checking it like almost instantly um, and it works well. Um, so again, if you wanna make your job server pull new jobs more quickly after it's been idle, jobprocessor.exe.config. And then the last one that happens all the time, why did my property sync slash view update job fail? Um, so here's the situation. I 
am going from review to release on an assembly and we're running short on time. Hopefully I can make this happen. Um, to demonstrate So I should have in the queue now, I have a synchronized properties job. And my job processor isn't currently running, so no jobs are being done. And then somebody comes in and says, oh, I need to make a quick change to that. And in the interim, the job processor starts. All right, so our job processor gets running and it's going to see that job. Um, and eventually it's going to try to do it, but it's going to fail. And it's going to fail because I queued the job against version eight. Version nine now exists in the vault. And by default, the synchronize properties job, it will not run against what's called a non tip version. So you may see this all the time. So this isn't the job processor being bad. This isn't the job processor failing or being terrible or whatever. This is just your job processor didn't get around to doing the job before something else happened to the file. And so the proper resolution to this is you can try to resubmit it, but otherwise just remove it. And then the, when your file goes back through the life cycle like it should, or there will be another job in the queue that was successfully done, depending on the timing, you don't need that synchronized property job anymore because some other job eventually took care of it. Right. Um, so we had some other things to talk about. We just have a couple of minutes and we do have a couple of questions. Um, I'd, I'd love to address those questions. Um, just real quick, know that there are some changes, there are some settings in the Vault server console that impact the user experience. Um, those are all in the advanced settings, advanced configuration settings, impersonation, this user account controls um, file store access. So for IT folks, if you tried to do a remote backup and it failed, impersonation is probably the problem. So Google Autodesk Vault remote backup impersonation, something like that, and you'll get some information about it. Um, if you want to keep your log files from piling up forever, you can control that here. Um, things like paging. Why do I only get 100 results at a time when I search? That's not enough. An administrator can come to the server and change that up to 1,000. Note, though, that that's going to have an impact on performance, right? Um, and then performance thresholds. Why do I always get a warning when I try to add 3,000 files at a time to Vault? Um, why can't I add more than you know 10,000 files to the Vault at a time? these performance thresholds are, are, are impacting that, right? All right, so we have, we're right at the at the limit of time, but um, for those of you that can stick around for just a couple minutes, I do wanna take a look at these questions that came in. Some of them look a little bit involved. Um, so question, I work in two different vault servers. Why in one server the view in window option works in one server, but not the other? That is a really good question that I do not know the answer to. So if you're talking about view in window, right, this is gonna try to open up in something, right? In this case, I think it's trying to open it up in inventor view. Um, the only thing I can think of why it would be different per server is if you, um, Actually, no, that's an options thing. Um, I'm gonna mark that question, um, Clinton, and I'm gonna see what I can find out about that because that one seems odd to me and I'll follow up with you. We should have your email. I'll follow up with you if I find anything out about it. So a question, what is the right workflow when we want to play with assemblies and parts, meaning editing, the, editing them, not checking them out? I always have a ton of green statuses which force me to check everything out before checking everything in when trying to save a random assembly where some child files have been edited once my workspace and it is very frustrating. That's a really good question. Um, you'd have a couple options there. <clears throat> um, I personally don't mind checking things out to play with them. Keeping in mind, you can always 
undo your checkout and revert to the latest vault version, right? Um, but even if you do get something with a green circle in your workspace and you, because you were playing around and you just changed them anyway, if you wanna make sure, okay, yeah, that didn't work, I wanna ditch what I had, um, you should always be able to either refresh file or get revision. Um, using one of these right-click options in the Vault browser should get you the ability to like and like undo your checkout and say replace working copies. This is going to get me back to the latest version that the Vault had. So undoing checkouts or refreshing your files. But if you're going to play with assemblies like that in parts, you do have to keep careful track of what you've changed and what you want to keep versus what you want to ditch. Um, there's no really magic button there to say, keep these other things and revert these others to vault. You do have to keep track of that. Um, question, if the job queue fails to create a PDF, can I manually force it to make a PDF of an approved drawing? Depending on the version of vault, yes. I can't remember if it was 2021 or 2022, but these days now we do on the right click menu have an option to create PDF. Create PDF will queue up a PDF job automatically. Failing that, there is a Vault client add-in called QJob from Cool Orange. This is an add-in you can install to your computer. It's free if you're on subscription, with the, which these days almost everybody is. Um, and this lets you customize a little file. You can add the ability to right click on files in Vault and queue a custom job or a standard job. So if you're using an older version of Vault right now that doesn't have the create PDF, you could install queue job and tweak this little file and that should let you queue up the PDF job against the file. All right, and we have run over time. Um, and now those were the last of the questions that came in. Um, so I really appreciate everyone's time today. Thanks for sticking around, almost everybody did. Um, it, that was great. Um, I hope it answered some uh, common questions you might have. Um, and I'll turn it over to Ashley to wrap things up. Okay, well thank you Forrest. And yes, thank you everyone for attending today. Um, just a reminder, you will receive an email tomorrow which will contain a link for the recording of this presentation so you can go back and watch it again. Um, and also a quick reminder that a survey will pop up as we close down today. And um, we do thank you for attending and have a great day everyone.